Okay, so we're going to work another problem where we work with a very specific function. And in this case, the function is f of x equals 2x over x minus 7. And this is a function from sets a to b. And again, we're going to show that this is a one-to-one -one and onto function. Just the way that we go about proving that is going to be just a little bit different. So here's our function f of x. And a is the set all reals except for the point 7. And you can see why the point 7 is not allowed in the domain of f, because if you plugged in x equals 7, on the denominator you'd have 7 minus 7 is 0, and things would blow up, so this is not allowed. What we're going to do is we're going to show that f is a 1 to 1 and onto function, just like I said. And we're going to show that it's a 1 to 1 and onto function on a set b. The way that we're going to go about doing this is just a little bit different. On the previous example, we actually used kind of the rigorous definitions of 1 to 1 and onto functions to show that a function was 1 to 1 and onto. In this problem, we're going to use a theorem that's very well known. We're not going to prove this theorem. This is almost in every textbook you ever look at. But there is a theorem that says if you can find a function g that goes from b to a that has these properties, namely the property g composed of f is the identity function on a, and f composed of g is the identity function on b, then f is a one-to-one -one and onto function. So another way to establish that f is a one-to-one -one and onto function is to construct a function g that has these properties. Okay? So if we can do that, then we know that f is one-to-one. -one. And not only that, we also know that g is the inverse function of f. So this actually provides us a little bit more information than just showing that it's one-to-one -one and onto. It actually lets us know what the inverse function of f is. Just to recall what these identity functions are, so ia and ib, just to recall what those are, these are called identity functions because whenever you evaluate them, you get exactly what you put in. For instance, the identity function i sub a, the subscript a tells us that this function takes elements in a, so the definition of the function is for all elements of a, the identity function evaluated at a just returns a. So like I said, it's an identity function because whatever you put in is exactly what comes out. Similarly, the identity function on b is a function defined on b, so it's good for all b in capital B. And wherever we evaluate the identity function on the set b, b is exactly what comes out. So again, it's the identity function because whatever we put into the function is exactly what comes out. So our goal here, if we want to establish that f is a one-to-one -one and onto function, is we are going to find g and b with these properties. So that's what we're going to do. And by these properties, I really mean these properties here that I've circled. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little bit of scratch work to try to figure out a good guess for what we think this function b is. So our function f of x was 2x divided by x minus 7. So when we get that value of f of x, I, I kind of think of that as y. Hey, you plug into this function, you get some output value called y. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of algebra and rearrange. So let's multiply both sides by x minus 7. And then we can go ahead and do the uh, distributive property multiplication and multiply that out. xy minus 7y equals 2x. And then we can factor out the x, there's a common factor of x on the left-hand side, and we can move the two x's to the left and also move the 7y to the right. Keep manipulating, and eventually we can come up with this. So we have basically isolated the x variable in the original expression and written x in terms of y, which is really f of x. So this function here is kind of our guess for what we think this g function might be, because I've basically inverted the function. Originally, I had it written down to where you tell me x and I'll compute y. Now we have it computed that you tell me y and I'll tell you x. So in some ways we've gone ahead and explicitly computed this inverse function, or what we think a good guess for it is. Let's go ahead and show that this actually works now. And let's actually define g of x as this quantity that we just computed. So g of x is equal to 7x over x minus 2, because that's exactly what I just computed up here. But now I'm just using the variable x. And we also need to worry about the domain and range of this function. Well, obviously, b is going to be the set all reals except for the point 2, because just by looking at it, we see if we plugged in x equals 2, things would blow up. But everything else would be good for g of x. I can evaluate g of x everywhere else on the reals except for this point. So our guess for b is the reals except the point 2. And let's go ahead and do our computation. Let's choose an x and a. 
So x is any value of a, and let's compute g composed of f. Okay? If you remember on the previous page, this is one of the properties that we needed to verify. g composed of f needs to equal x, and f composed of g needs to equal basically x, the identity function. So let's go ahead and compute this. Well, by definition, g composed of f is just g evaluated at the point f of x, which is g evaluated at 2x over x minus 2, because that's what the function f of x is equal to. And now we need to replace every time we see an x in g of x, so there's two spaces, two spots where we see an x, we need to replace that with 2x over x minus 2. We're just evaluating the function g of x at that point. So I've done that here. Everywhere that I had an x in the function g of x, I've replaced it with the argument of the function. And now we just have to do algebra. So if we multiply this out, we multiply the 7 times the 2x to get a 14x over x minus 2. And if we get a common denominator there on the denominator, we get this. Now you can see that the x minus 2s are going to cancel. So we just end up with 14x over 2x minus 2x plus 14. The 2x minus 2x gives us 0, so we just end up with 14x over 14. And we get x. So we started with an arbitrary element of a. We computed g composed of f, and we got x. So basically, we've just shown that g composed of f is indeed the identity function on a. I took a, a point in a, plugged it in, and I got out the exact same point in a. So we have just shown that g composed of f is the identity function i sub a. Okay, so that's the first thing we had to check. What about the next thing we need to check? We need to check that for every x in b, f composed of g is the identity function on b. So let's go ahead and do that computation. So this, by definition, is just f evaluated at g of x. g of x is 7x over x minus 2. I replace every point that there was an x in the function f with 7x over x minus 2. So I do that here. I do a little bit of algebra, multiply out the 2, get a common denominator on the denominator. Again, the x minus 2s cancel. I distribute some multiplications. I get 7x minus 7x plus 14. This turns into 14x over 14. And again, I get x. So again, we've started with an arbitrary element of x. We've computed this function and shown that it's equal to x. So f composed of g is indeed the identity function on the set b. So we found a g, a function, and a set b that goes along with it. So by the theorem, we have now shown that f is a one-to-one -one and on-do function because g has the desired properties that it needed to have. And specifically, not only do we know that f is a one-to-one -one and on-to function, we also know by the theorem that g is the inverse function of f. Okay, so this is just a different way to prove that a function is one-to-one -one and onto by actually constructing a function g that is the inverse and the appropriate set b and then using this theorem.